Hey, hey guys, I'm back doing the vlog. So, article, could NIM, NIM is a programming language, could NIM replace Python? Ah, uh, yes, this is a article that's on Medium. And I'll just read the introduction. Who is the author? Uh, Emmett Baudreau, just published. Introduction. For many years now, programming no programming language has been better suited for scripting than Python. I don't know about that. It depends on the environment. Let me go on. Python is an interpreted language written in the late 1980s by Guido van Runsum. I think it was in the 90s, early 90s, but I could be wrong. Uh, it was written in the language C. Van Roosum, like many other famous computer scientists in the Netherlands, is from the Netherlands, rather, where he wrote Python from within Centrum Wiskund and Informatica, or in rough English translation, National Research Institute of Mathematics and Computer Science. Python has massive benefits of traditional lower-level languages that populated computers at the time, such as C, Fortran, C++, Lisp. Firstly, Python syntax is far more simple and easy to grasp. You know, the guy who wrote this article on Medium, clearly English is not his first language. It's written here, Python has massively, excuse me, Python has massive benefits of traditionally lower level languages. It should have written, Python has massive benefits over traditional lower level languages. The video is sponsored by Kite, which is a machine learning powered plugin that works with major code editors like Atom, VS Code, Sublime, Vim, and PyCharm. And basically they use machine learning to superpower code completions. So I'm showing you Kite in action so you can see how it works. Kite uses ranked completions that are sorted by relevance rather than popularity or alphabetical order. Kite has line of code completion, so it completes a full line of code. They have something called intelligent snippets, which is an advanced function call experience using machine learning to suggest placeholder values. Finally, if you look on the uh, right-hand side, as the cursor moves, you see an example of something called Copilot, which uh, basically displays the docs relative to wherever your cursor happens to be. One of the big selling points for me about Kite is that it will reduce the number of lines of code that you write by as much as 50%. As you know, I don't take many sponsors, so this is a worthwhile product to get into, and it's free. Link is below. He goes on to talk about how good Python is, easy to understand syntax, huge libraries, modules, they're called modules, basically Python has a module that can do anything. You, I'm sure there's a module where you can order pizza with Uber Eats in Python. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so he goes on to talk about this language NIM, which is relatively new, it's like 10 years old, compared to like JavaScript, Java, Python, and a whole bunch of other languages. It's kind of new. And he starts to go on about NIM, NIM. What's good about NIM? Firstly, NIM is faster than Python while still being interpreted by the same language C. Though NIM is technically run within an interpreter, it should be noted that NIM has its own compiler. That said, there are a lot of cool features that make NIM a great potential replacement for Python that you might not have expected. He then goes on to name some of NIM advantages. I can compile down to executables, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, it ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And he, he concludes in the article, I should say, you should learn NIM. No, you shouldn't. Unless you're a nerd who just wants to nerd it up a little bit, you know? NIM is not a language you should spend your time learning. If your goal is to make money, if you get a job, start freelancing, start your own business, you shouldn't waste a moment of your time learning NIM. Now, I'm not dissing NIM. NIM could be a great language. But NIM is going to, I'm firmly in the camp that NIM will always be a, a hyper niche language that is used by like 0.01% of nerds 
And chances of you finding a job or a NIM requirement in any project you're involved with is next to nothing. I always look at programming languages and technologies as being tools that you can leverage in your career. I don't see them as the end goal. I see them as simply as tools. Just like carpenter will have tools, will have hammers and saws, plumbers will have tools, etc., etc. You got to look at all these technology languages, all these frameworks as tools. I came into programming in the 1990s with a job I wanted to get done rather than learning how to program to get a job. And because I was an entrepreneur before I was a coder, programmer, I always look at programming and coding from the point of view, from the lens, from the frame of an entrepreneur. So I look at this language, NIM, and as I said, it's, it could very well be technically a very good language. But you can't just look at the language's technical merits when you're assessing a programming language. You have to look at the business use, the market share, the size of the community, because I've been there, I've been there back in the 1990s where there were cool languages or cool frameworks that I knew were much better than the mainstream. And I learned them and I spent time learning them. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. And then I couldn't make any money with them. And then nobody wanted to use them. And then what happens, the language or the framework slowly, slowly gets abandoned. And then heaven forbid you have an application that you've built that's key to your business or important in your business. And all of a sudden the language or the framework or the library is no longer supported by the community. They've moved on. Why? Because they're not making any money. They can't make any money with this thing. So they move on. And then all of a sudden, you have to switch off because languages and frameworks and libraries have to be maintained, they have to be updated, they have to be, you know, bug fixes, security fixes, new implementations within the technology stack to account for uh, the trend of the day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that said and done, we are in a fortunate time as nerds these days, as programmers, in the sense that the rapid change in the technology stacks have, uh, that has largely diminished. You see, when a new industry emerges, when a new technology emerges, you see, you look in history, you see, you know, like when the first automobiles came out, there were literally hundreds of automobile manufacturers. And you look at early photos, they had all these ideas about how to build a car, three wheels, that wheel, they had steam cars, and even had electric cars in the past, way in the past. And over time, and so in the first few years rather, there's this quick evolution in the industry. All these different types of cars, technology advances real quick, but over time, there's like a graph, you see the slope, the steeper the slope, like a steep, steep on a hill, like a mountain, you know, steeper. Initially, when a technology emerges, you see a lot of changes, and every two years, it seems, something is like very different. And because there's a lot of, there's a huge evolution, quick pace changes uh, in the industry as it matures. I saw this, I saw this, I lived through this in the 1990s with the web stack. It was incredibly fast. Within a year or two, everything would be outdated. Um, but the web stack, is, uh, was it over 20 years old now? Yeah, it's like 25 years old now. And I can tell you, in terms of its evolution, in terms of application development in general, not just the web stack, overall application development, everything has kind of plateaued in the last six years or so. You could argue that the web stack has pretty much plateaued since uh, 19, not 19, since 2012. I would say it's about 2012. When HTML5 specification came out, thank the Lord, because what was there previously, XHTML, which I always hated. You can check articles I was writing back there. I said XHTML was going to go, as I predicted, it did. Um, so HTML5 sort of hit the mainstream, I figured, in around 2012, 2013. You know, that is where we still are today in terms of front-end web development. In terms of server-side, 
it's pretty much the same as it was going back even further. One caveat, DevOps has become much more sophisticated and uh, in terms of uh, server security, SSH, as opposed to secure passwords, that kind of stuff. Um, source control has become much better, more sophisticated with things like Git. Beyond that, in terms of the app development itself, it's pretty much the same. I'm starting to see uh, new names for old concepts. Like uh, back in the 90s, flat file databases were pretty uh, popular in the early 90s. And then everybody migrated to uh, SQL-based relational databases. Uh, flat file databases, these days we call them no SQL databases. They're just a, an evolution of that way of thinking about storing data. Um, you see the emergence again of the um, static website generators. I, I'm sure somebody will mention some uh, products that are out there where instead of every time the page loads of a server coding generates the page like PHP, Java, uh, I guess Node, yeah, Node uh, Python, Ruby, Python Django, Ruby Rails, uh, .NET, instead of generating a page every single time, in a static configuration, there are caching things you can do, but with static page generators, the, the, the system is designed where the pages are all built, then thrown on the server, so it's rare that the pages are actually generated by the server, and this has security advantages, it has huge advantages in terms of speed, since you're not doing heavy processing every time a page is loaded, but there are also disadvantages. I actually used to have a directory way back in the day and it was Perl based and it was a static page generator. And you would, it was kind of cool. I liked it. I like it in principle, personally. I'm going off on a bit of a tangent because it's just secure. And it's just so resource unintensive because like when you have a directory, that's what this was. At one point, directories were like super popular, like, kind of like social networks are today. And so when you have a directory, the listings in the directory don't update very often, once in a while. So that's a perfect example where you could use a static page generator to generate your pages. So I had one, and I would just list uh, web uh, developers and designers around the world. So why generate these pages all the time? Because you, you know, you'd update a listing once every few days maybe, right? So why generate that dynamically? Just have it pre-generated so they're just sitting there as HTML pages. And what would happen is when somebody would add a listing to a particular city, the system was smart enough to go, okay, just update that one page for that one city for that one listing. That's it. It might update like five pages. And it would just go, and it'll be updated, and all these HTML pages would sit there. So when you have that kind of thing, it's much more difficult to hack, much less resource intensive. Anyway, so they were doing this type of stuff in the 90s. Now they have a different name for it, and people are rediscovering, well, there's great new tech, pros and cons to everything. Anyway, so going back to NIM here, I just don't see it as a different enough technology to bring enough of a, an advantage to warrant people wanting to invest in the t this tech. As one of my old uncles used to tell me, he used to manage these $50 million projects for the Canadian government, high-tech projects, and he said for a new technology to replace an old, the new technology has to be at least 10 times better than the old. And that's a key thing. That means it just has to be a lot better. I just don't see it now, for the most part, in the normal IT stack, whether it be web, native, data mobile, simply because the stuff is so good now. We've had that rapid rate of change from the 1990s through to the early 2000s, and it started to, the slope started to uh, level out. And in 2012, the front end web stack and really flattened out. Like, it hasn't changed much. What you do on the front end in terms of CSS, HTML5, JavaScript, hasn't changed much since like 2012. Yeah, a few things here and there on the periphery. But in terms of the core, it's the same. The pages that you wrote in 2012 will work 100% today. Now, 
back in the day, back in the old days, in the 1990s, the pages you would write in 1994 very likely didn't work too well in 1996. The stuff you wrote in 1996 didn't come out too good in 1999. You get the idea, right? I remember a friend of mine who made uh, very good money in the early to mid-1990s as a, in the web space, and he was a coder, and he went into management, and then he kind of left the game from 1997, 98, he left the game, and uh, he was out. And he came back into it around 2003, something like that, just like four or five years later, something like that. It's rough numbers. And I remember he calls me up and he goes, Steph, I was getting back in the web game. It is so different. It's totally different. Yes, it was still HTML, but it was so different. Now it was all about CSS and the way you structured code was so much better. So much better was better, but it was so different. The whole process of developing sites had changed radically just in a few years. It's not the same anymore. As I said, pages that you've built in 2010, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they're all gonna work today and they're all gonna work for the foreseeable future. So yeah, this language, I don't see it as being 10 times better than anything else. I'm sure there are certain advantages here and there. Would I learn it? Is there a technological advantage? Is there a business advantage for you to learn it? I, I really seriously doubt it. You're better off to uh, develop your communication skills. You're better off to learn how to do freelancing. You're better off to learn how to manage projects more effectively, to communicate more effectively. If you wanna make more money, if you wanna get more freelance clients, if you want to advance in your job, you want more of a chance of landing your job, learning some obscure, rarely used language like NIM will serve no purpose. But learning how to communicate better, learning how to write better docs, learning how to uh, send better emails, <laughs> that's going to help you a lot more. Understanding the whole process of managing a project by doing some freelance work to get that training is going to help you much more. To develop your reputation in doing that, to get a better reputation, to improve your resume, that's going to help you much more. Again, I look at coding not just from a coding technical point of view, I look at it from a business point of view. You should too. If your goal is a career, make money, personal freedom, then this is what you got to do. I hope that helps. A little learning, learning lessons from the old nerd on the YouTubes. <laughs>